Okay, we're ready for our third speaker in this afternoon's session, and it is Jason Rizio, and he'll talk about current status of Tanzania's wildlife corridor. All right, thank you much. Howdy, folks, and good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to chat about some work I'm doing at University of California, Davis, on wildlife corridors, mapping these potential wildlife movements. No tags on anything yet, so no fancy uh, movement uh, videos, but hopefully some interesting maps to look at. Um, first and foremost, I have to thank some of my co-authors, folks who have been working with me on this project and collaborating and at least creating the methodology for, for what's been used here, uh, both Andrew Jacobson and Andrew Stanish, and also my advisor, Dr. Tim Cara at UC Davis. Uh, this work kind of started off by looking at, at kind of the extraordinary assessment of Tanzania's national uh, wildlife corridor kind of complex. And, Tanzania is incredibly unique in the fact that it's one of the only places on the planet where um, a country has identified and, and at least preliminary assessed all of its wildlife corridors. And this was done in 2009 and 2010 by the Tanzanian Wildlife Research Institute, um, these two papers up here. And a total of 36 corridors were identified, of which approximately 75% were thought to be at risk of severing, being totally lost in five years. So it's 2014, about five years later, so it was a good time to take a, a second look. And, and arguably, a lot of these corridors were, were kind of anecdotal. So there was some, some vague information that maybe there are wildlife movements between this protected area and that protected area, but there wasn't much exactly known, especially not about land cover. So I don't want to beat you over the head with the pros and cons of wildlife corridors, but, but broadly, evidence is showing that where there are intact habitats linking protected areas. Um, large mammals in particular tend to use them, at least um, for seasonal movements, potentially for dispersal. Um, and there's some advantages to this, and, and that was kind of captured in the idea of, of assessing the corridors for Tanzania, why they might be important to protect. Um, and also kind of as we're moving forward with, with climate change studies, the idea that um, animals are moving along latitudinal and elevation gradients based on potential corridors between parks. Um, so more broadly, my, my kind of research intention, my, my goals were to, to reassess, do this reassessment of the 36 corridors that were identified in 2009, um, and, and broadly say which ones potentially still exist, which may have been severed by land conversion over this period, um, possibly identify some that may have been overlooked in those in initial assessments. And then what came out of that was, was, the, was a potential corridor hub that I wanted to evaluate on the ground using interview data. Uh, so definition is always good, especially when talking about corridors, because people have all sorts of definitions. So I wanted to broadly say that a wildlife corridor was going to be lands that were currently unprotected, linking uh, national parks or game reserves within the country. Um, they contain continuous natural land cover. So these are open savanna, woodland, grassland habitats, with, and, and as such exclude land conversion, agricultural areas, villages, mines, roads, et cetera. Um, and you know, these are irrespective of wildlife movements. And also due to the, the methodology, they had to be at least one kilometer in width or larger. So anything smaller than that, I had to set aside. And just to kind of show you the, an extreme, very cool example of it was a recent addition of uh, a wild corridor south of Mount Kenya. So they actually built a wildlife underpass under a main highway there for elephants in which is apparently working rather well. So a corridor of that size was not going to be picked up by this analysis. Um, so one of the ways to potentially exclude land conversion was to look at the global remote sensing classification data sets. So there's a, a broad variety, but, but arguably one of the best and one of the most recent was completed by the European Space Agency in 2009, their globe cover product. So this is global land, land cover classification. Um, and really looking at forest, grassland, agricultural lands. So I just generally binned everything conversion, here shown in black together, and everything that was natural land cover in, in light green there. And then uh, dark green areas uh, bounded in red are the, the national parks and game reserves. And so looking at that, I thought, you know, it was maybe a little, a little iffy. There's a lot of black showing up in protected areas. And we know that in a number of these, uh, like the Salu, Raha, Tarangire, 
are, are really well protected. There's no farms or agriculture in those regions. So there was something fishy there. And then even furthermore, if you look up in the Serengeti, the connection between Serengeti and the Mara, where the massive wildebeest migration is, um, is apparently covered in, in farms. So that was worrisome. And then also this large patch of supposedly natural land cover south of Lake Victoria uh, also struck me as being a little worrisome. That's one of the biggest agricultural areas in the country. And so I looked a little further into, well, it took like a five-minute search in Google Earth. And this is what that landscape looks like just south in the center of that circle. So it's, as far as you can see, agricultural areas and, and towns and roads. Um, so barring a few million dollars in, in the satellite imagery they had, they did a really poor job of classifying land cover. And it, it, arguably, it's, it's incredibly difficult to do. So especially in, in savanna areas, dry tropical regions, to tell a, a, a small-scale agriculture from the grassland or shrubland next to it using satellite imagery and spectral signatures is really, really tricky. Um, we can look at that and go, well, there's not a shred of natural land cover there because we see shapes. Right? We're really good at identifying shapes. So I had to throw out the possibility of using the globe cover product. That wasn't going to work for this analysis. And so myself and the two Andrews worked to develop a program, um, some software that uses Google Earth imagery. This is a great free data set, super high resolution. Uh, if only we can classify it, we thought. And so um, we developed a, a web program that would allow us to do this. And so I decided to look at Tanzania first. And we broke up the whole of the country into 335 50 by 50 kilometer grids, 2,500 square, 2, square kilometers. And each one of these grids, using our program, we overlaid a, um, a 50 by 50 uh, lattice of cells, so 2,500 cells. I didn't do the math, but it's a lot of cells. So 2,500 times 335, um, without a small army of, of interns from Duke University and, and UC Davis, who I'm incredibly grateful to. This work could not have been done because we, we literally hand identified every single cell over the whole of Tanzania. Um, and the grid itself is clickable. So we were able to identify looking at a, at a cell, is it natural land cover or is it converted? 50% um, being the threshold between the two. Um, and, and a little preview of, of the work that's coming out is we actually now complete this for the whole of East Africa, um, which is kind of absurd in scale when you think about it. But the way that, that more generally it looks, so zooming into the Google Earth imagery, we have a landscape here south of Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, the red areas are areas we identified as being converted 50% or more. And the white areas are natural lands. So that's formed the basis, the base layer for this analysis. And to kind of pat ourselves on the back, I would say, arguably we created the, the most accurate, at least, uh, map of land conversion for any country to date. So that's shown here. Um, the same color scheme. So black areas are those that have been deemed converted. Light green are natural lands, and dark green are the protected areas. So this went into just a very basic model of, of, of corridors, a least cost path model. I wanted to keep it very simple to start off with. Um, oh, and before that, so one thing that came out was that there are protected areas that, that are purely islands in a sea of degraded habitats. So these are areas that arguably so, have no connections to surrounding protected areas. And, and the one a particular note is out here in the west, Gombe Stream, so famous for his chimpanzees and Jane Goodall's research, um, is, is now completely isolated from the surrounding forest lands, um, from chimpanzees that potentially live in the Mahale region, the Gala region. Um, so I created a, a basic least cost path model, and um, just using a simple cost surface. So I said, well, if I'm an elephant, doesn't cost me much. It's not, it's not terribly difficult to move across natural land, so they have a value of one. Um, moving across agricultural fields, a little bit more difficult, you know, 10 times the value. And to say, you know, basically, you cannot move across large bodies of water, lakes, so a value of 100. And um, calculating the least cost path, the shortest distance between protected areas crossing the lowest value cells, a very simple model. And you know, to, to show the broad potential wildlife corridors there, they're shown in white. So those are the, be the least cost paths between protected areas. And very simply was able to say, well, which ones still exist based on the 2009 report? Which ones have been severed? Which ones have degraded in quality in terms of narrowing in width? Um, and so that said, of the, the 36 corridors originally identified about five years ago, 23 appear to be 
remain open, that they still contain natural land cover. Um, nine have deteriorated in quality, so they have shrunk considerably since the previous assessment. But only six appear to have been completely severed by land conversion. So not good news, but not the 75% that was suggested might be at risk initially. Um, seven of the original corridors assessed were, were too small. or didn't have the, uh, the right land cover to, to properly assess using this technique, using the, our, our land cover map. Um, but an additional six came out of this research, so we identified potentially six more. Um, and that, you know, the, the, the bad news was that five of Tanzania's protected areas are, are completely cut off from the surrounding areas, are isolated. So I want to zoom into an area. So one thing it's, you know, to sit in an armchair in California and decide how many corridors there are in Tanzania, which is a little absurd on, on one part, but you know, another thing to go there and actually try and identify where these corridors might be beyond just natural land cover. And this reserve here, Wami and Biki Wildlife Management Area, struck me as being this corridor hub. It's potentially linked uh, to several protected areas surrounding it in probably the most densely populated area in Tanzania. Um, Dar es Salaam, the largest city in the country, is off to the side here. Dodoma, the capital, is here. Morogoro, another one of the largest cities in the country, just to the south. So it's in a highly human impacted area, but centrally located amongst other protected areas. Um, I'm going to switch the colors on you here for a second, so forgive me. But a closer look, so Wami and Biki and the surrounding protected areas are still in green. The land conversion is in brown, and the light gray areas show natural lands. And the red areas just are the basic general broad, if I was an elephant crossing natural lands, this is the basic route to potentially take. And so one way to, to assess or you know, to, to get a look at do these corridors exist, you can show up and you can look. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to, to travel, do some work in Wami and Biki, and I went to the Uluguru Mountains down here to, to do some hiking and looked out up the mountains across that landscape that was supposed to be converted, very, you know, covered in farms, covered in city. Um, looked the other way, beautiful forest, really just an excuse to show some pretty pictures, because obviously just looking was not going to to get the answers I wanted. We already knew from the satellite imagery where potential land cover was. Um, the other way that seemed fairly obvious was to ask people who lived there. So individuals and villages surrounding the, the protected area have to deal with wildlife moving through the lands every single year. They know when elephants move. They know where they move. Um, so I traveled to all 24 villages in the Wami Mbiki Society, so in the community-based wildlife management area and an additional six that kind of filled in some of the gaps around um, and ran interviews with the, the Village Resources Commission about where they see animals move, are there corridors, are there paths that animals use, when, which species, et cetera. And took the information they gave me and overlaid that back on the map. So looked at between which villages were they saying were animal movements. And the, the consistency of the reports was remarkable. We get five, six villages in a row that all say between Ubena and we do elephants move every December and every July. So the consistency was, was at least heartening in the fact that we believed what, what was being told and, and that we could expect that those corridors do, do actually exist. And so putting their, their responses back on the map between the particular <coughs> villages um, got a sense of where wildlife movements were mi more likely to occur uh, rather than just the natural land cover itself. Um, a couple of things kind of came out of that. One that was interesting was the, the use of Uzagua as a, a stepping stone between Wami Biki and Sedani National Park so that it was pretty consistent. Folks were saying that, that elephants and potentially buffalo were moving out of Wami Biki to Uzagua and then across to Sedani. And kind of unknown what happened beyond there. So north of Uzagua is the Maasai Steppe, onward to uh, Karangiri National Park and Kamazi. So that, that still remains kind of the, the question mark on the map. And the other really interesting information that came from this was that elephants were preferentially leaving Wami Biki, not following the, the shortest path between Wami Biki and Makumi, but rather preferentially leaving the park, entering farmlands, um, raiding crops, kind of along their corridor path so that simply excluding agricultural areas is, is a little too simplistic from the, from the view of an elephant, at least. Um, and, you know, it always feels good when, when what you predict 
from space kind of matches up with at least what people are on the ground are saying. And then the next question is, what happens, um, what are animals actually doing? So how do we actually confirm not just what the satellites say and what people say, but what animals are actually doing, which species are using them, and how to possibly capture that, that movement information. Um, so that's the next, the, the questions that, of course, I would like to ask the, the experts here at some point um, to see how to potentially capture dispersal movements, not just seasonal, seasonal migration. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, my funders here and, and offer a chance to ask any questions. Thank you. Yeah? With your meat cost analysis, did you do a sensitivity study for the, the cost of the different, of traveling across the different types of landscapes? So, so no. And the important part was that, that you know, all, a lot of these least cost path analysis and the cost surfaces that are created to, to do the analysis are basically expert opinion, right? People send out questionnaires, they ask a lot of people, and they say, how hard is it an elephant to move through shrubland? How hard is it to move through uh, you know, forest? And it's, it's hard to get any sort of honest data about that. I didn't want to bias the information based on, number one, poor land classification, because the maps were going to be terrible, given what we knew about the space agency, and also about you know, opinions about where elephants may or may not like to move, because we know that they use a lot of landscapes. And if they're just moving across the space from point A to point B, it may not be what's optimum or ideal, but they may be more flexible than that. So I wanted to keep it very simple. Uh, slope would probably be the, the other single most important factor there. Um, mountains and, and hills are going to be, to be barriers to movement. Um, but the question is how to get that exactly right. That's, that's another tricky component. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So the Wami River here is absolutely the corridor that, that elephants use. And that's, that's actually the one place where there is movement data in this region, so they had collared some elephants in Sudani and watched them move along the Wami River back and forth along that corridor. Um, and it's partly it's also because the, the river corridors are areas that flood frequently, so they're not going to have villages or permanent crops in them. So they also happen to be paths of, of natural land cover. Yes? Mm-hmm. Um, so mostly it was, it was anecdotal. So they were asking researchers in the areas, where do you see wildlife movement? Um, you know, is, is this protected area connected to that protected area? So it was partly questionnaire based. <coughs> some of it was based on, on known movement. So there is a, there's some tracking of wildlife in some of the regions across the country. So, so that's happening to a degree. But, but a lot of it's just, you know, we asked them and they said that. And so we put it into a report. Well, it's, it's obviously the goal. And, and so part, part of what this, this information gets us, part of what this map allows us to show is, are these the areas where there's, there's really narrow corridors? If, if some protection isn't put into place immediately, you really are at risk of losing them. Instead of kind of waving arms saying 75%, most of them are going to disappear, um, which probably isn't true immediately. Um, but we're able to now highlight, say, you know, these five, these are really at risk. If, if we're interested in maintaining connectivity between this protected area and that, we need to make sure that we leave some space open for wildlife movements. And, and that's actually presented at the, to where the Tanzania Wildlife Research Institute's last conference and talked to the folks there about that and identifying those conservation priorities.